Well, the important thing is to make sure that something after 2015 comes out substantive, comes out meaningful, and will not be a, a repeat of business as usual. You know, that's the biggest fear we have. Because uh, uh, Rio, Rio Plus 20, MDGs, you know, all this thunder and lightning that we heard, you know, with not a drop actually hitting the ground. Now, you, we really need to avoid that. Uh, we have just too much time of very talented and capable people and too much resources, you know, thrown at these problems and not really solving it or not even, forget solving it, not even ameliorating it or shifting direction slightly towards sustainability. So things have got worse, you know, conflicts are even worse around the world, uh, development, you know, the rich have got richer, the poor countries have got much poorer, you know, you name it all. So if we are going to do anything different, if we're going to have anything meaningful and if we're going to instill a sense of hope in people that are getting either fatalized or radicalized, then we need to introduce some uncomfortable knowledge. Uh, it's uncomfortable because the powers that be have chosen to sort of uh, ignore it. It's there, the reality is tearing you in the ground, just go and visit any village in one of these poor countries and you see how people are voting with their feet, uh, how they're taking decisions and so on. Uh, somehow I, I feel that, uh, as I said, forget the, at the international level, which is twice removed, uh, even at the national level, national governments are, I, well, I'm sure they must be aware because after all people who man the government come from these kind of villages, but there's an ignoring of these issues. Uh, and then going along with the with the flow, uh, and uh, you know, thinking this is fine, and you know, uh, let's go on. Very much, it's a given rise. Even let's take a uh, well, forget Nepal's case. I mean, we, we went through a ten-year insurgency, part of which was related to the failure of development. Okay, uh, take a case like India, which is supposed to be a. Uh, what is it? They call themselves the largest democracy in the world. Well, if half your districts are under some kind of Naxalite insurgency, Maoist insurgency now in India, then it means that you know your development is not really you know all that growth rate of China and India and all that you talk about. That's not really reaching the people down there. It's making a couple of people in Bombay or uh, I don't know Delhi obscenely rich. I mean, here is this Bombay businessman who has made a 27-story home for himself with a helicopter pad landing on top in the, in the middle of areas surrounded by slums. Now, he's a successful businessman, but you know, if that is the kind, of, that, that is where we measure success uh, and fail to see the slums all around and the sense of frustration and hopelessness, then I think we are in deep trouble. I think we're really in deep trouble. So my hope is that, you know, the effort that, uh, you know, with the IIED that, uh, uh, some of us all got together to put in to make sure that we influence the uh, the global agenda setting that's going on around post-2015, uh, uh, whatever will replace the uh, MDGs, uh, is meaningful. And that's, that's my hope. I mean, I'm not sure how much will succeed, but the point is to keep trying. I have a bit of a problem with this word. Uh, policymaker. Now, in the Western context, Northern European, American, Euro-American context, I mean, policymaker is, you know, guys sitting in the government, I guess, you know, secretaries, undersecretaries, whatever they call them, we don't know that. Huh? And uh, it's important in European context, but in our context, they are not the only policymaker. They are a factor among policymaking. Uh, I like to use this definition of power, uh, policy, as formula for the use of power. And the moment you say that policy is a formula for use of power, it begs the question, whose power? 
how many types of power there are, who has how much of it, and how do they deploy it. And, uh, you know, being what I call, what, what we have called cultural theorists, uh, we argue that the policy terrain is plural. Uh, governments and government bureaucracies are important policy makers, but the policy tool they deploy, the formula for deployment of their power, is procedural coercive power. You know, you don't follow the law, we're going to send you to jail. Okay, that's how it is. With the business individualistic market community, it is persuasive, seductive power. Uh, you know, you buy our product and you'll, you know, you'll be next to heaven. You know, this brand of product or that, you know. So it's, it's seductive, it's advertising, but they do find cheerful solutions. And we give credit to the market that they do innovate and they do come out uh, with solutions. We argue that they also are using a form of power. Now that's not enough. You also have a third kind of power, uh, which is the ethical power, the moral power. Hmm. I like to keep giving this example that Mahatma Gandhi uh, did not have an army and uh, he didn't have much money anyway, at least compared to the British Empire. But he did have ethical power. And he stuck to it. See, so these activists, these genuine NGOs. I know. I mean, I distinguish between phantom and genuine NGOs. Uh, some of the genuine activist NGOs are based on that ethical power that something is wrong in the world, that there's unfairness, you know, and therefore, you know. So the deployment of this critical power is also equally important. So when we talk of policy changes, you know, and policymakers are listening or not. Whether governments, politicians, you know, government bureaucrats are listening or not is only a third of the problem. And generally, they do not listen to, you know, conferences and conference papers and things. Uh, yeah, they listen to it, but they, you've really got to put the heat on them. Mm. And the heat on them comes from the, uh, both the market and the egalitarian activist community. And if the voice of those groups or those concerns can be brought onto the policy terrain, then the, then the political uh, policy makers will listen. And that's, that's the trick. That's how we've got to go about it. I'm more confident now than I was, say, in the 1990s and early 2000s. Uh, that's when, you know, they had this Washington consensus, end of history, market will do everything kind of nonsense. Uh, hopefully that's out of the window after this 2008 financial crisis when I think uh, the Euro-Americans kind of woke up or at least the, uh, the activist community in Europe and America woke up actually. Uh, they were in slumber. Uh, they had given up. Uh, they had given up the fight. Uh, they had... Uh, Oh, well, you know, governments, markets will do it and all. And uh, they were too beholden to their own, uh, you know, governments pushing for these kind of governmental solutions uh, that were not working. Now they've woken up and said, no, it's not enough to give leave governments and businesses to themselves. It can be a extremely, you know, comfortable sort of uh, bedfellows uh, who will probably not... Uh, who will probably serve their own interests, but will not serve the interests of the larger globe or the larger um, community. So the hopeful sign for me is that the activist community in Europe and America have uh, uh, woken up after about a decade, decade and a half of slumber. I think they went to sleep after the Berlin Wall collapsed. You know, you know, there's nothing to fight, you know, everything's over and all. It's not true. Uh, there's a need to fight even more. 